Hello, and welcome back to the Argyle HR Hiring and Retention Workforce Summit. My name is Vicki Limbrunskill with Argyle. It's great to have everyone joining us today. Just a couple of notes before I turn things over to our panel moderator. First, a quick reminder to stop by our sponsors' virtual booths at any time during today's event and for the following week. Our partners are committed to providing you with valuable content and a great overall experience today. And any time during the event, you can visit their virtual booths from the main agenda page, and those do include complimentary materials, information, and meet and greet opportunities. To ask questions throughout this session, in all sessions, simply type into the Q&A chat and we will address your questions at the end of the session. And now, without further delay, I'd like to introduce our moderator, Rose Rogers, Chief Human Resources Officer at Vortex Industries. We are so excited to have Rose and our panelists with us for a panel discussion titled Talent Acquisition, A New Look at Hiring Strategies. Welcome, Rose. Over to you. Thank you and good morning, everyone. And thank you for joining. You know, such an important subject of talent management, acquisition, recruiting, and retention. And uh, as mentioned, I'm the CHRO of Vortex Doors. So when I think about my career, my number one job is talent. And so now let me introduce uh, our panelist, uh, Carly. Thank you so much, uh, Carly Ackerman. I'm the Director of Customer Experience at Eightfold AI, a talent intelligence platform that supports the end-to-end -end talent lifecycle. Um, really excited to be here today and share a little bit of my perspective from a tech enabled uh, from the tech enabled lens. All right, Melissa. Hey, uh, my name is Melissa Frank. I'm the director of talent recruitment at New York Public Radio, which is a public media organization in New York City. Uh, my background is in education recruiting uh, before I moved on to media, and I've been in recruitment for about 15 years. Thank you. And Shipla. Hey, uh, my name is Shipla Kulkarni, and I'm a senior director of tech recruiting with Expedia Groups. Um, all my career has been in tech recruiting. So before coming to Expedia, I worked at Facebook, now Meta, for many years, and before that at Microsoft. So anything related to tech recruiting uh, probably is something that I can, uh, I'm passionate about, I can help with. So thank you for having me here. Great, thank you. So let us get started. Uh, we do have some questions that we thought of that we would help drive it. So the first one, what are some effective and innovative ways that you've seen companies use technology to improve how they evaluate and fine tune hiring needs? Chipla, why don't you uh, tell us what you've been doing? Awesome, and thank you, Rose. This has been, uh, you know, uh, something that all recruiting teams uh, across US and I should say across globe, everyone is adapting. And the first thing that comes to my mind is artificial intelligence. Lots and lots of ways to use AI to automate tasks like screening the resumes or um, you know, scheduling the initial interviews or even finding out what the candidate's passions are. AI is a really very useful tool. And I feel that it will free up time for recruiters and sources to do more uh, strategic partnerships or uh, to build a relationship or give that human touch to the whole process. The second thing that I'm seeing more and more being used, and uh, this is in, in the volume hiring nowadays, is use of predictive analysis. That means you see how the candidates are, uh, uh, they, how did they grow within their career? How did they grow uh, in the projects? And then potentially use the predictive analysis tools to find out whether they are going to be really successful in the company, in the culture, in the given role um, that uh, they you will be offering them or they will be accepting within your company. And the third thing, obviously, going global. So technology is helping immensely. Now, look, we all are on Zoom talking to many, many people logging in from uh, different locations. Um, getting right candidate is important. And so going global or going in various locations uh, becomes equally important. So these three things, I feel that technology is of help, rather utmost help to make us do the better recruitment every single day and even to provide a good candidate experience. Thank you. Thank you. Carly, anything to add? 
Yeah, I, I'd love to zoom in on the the mention of AI. I'm a, a little bit partial to to AI in the talent space, as you might imagine. Uh, but what really is exciting to me about this, not only the fact that we're we are here with an audience of HR leaders and we're ready and prepared to talk about AI without running for the hills. I think that's you know step one is we're just excited that we're prepared to take it on. Um, the, the potential of AI within the HR space is so huge. Um, this technology is what's going to allow you to shift from hiring for experience to hiring for potential. So AI is going to afford you the opportunity to really look at insights related to skills and uh, a candidate's ability to learn. And that means hiring can go beyond the resume, beyond the cover level, Better, even beyond the referral or the recommendation. Um, so recruiters and hiring managers just have a better sense of what a candidate can do tomorrow rather than just what they're bringing with them today based upon their prior experience. Great, thank you. Melissa, anything else that, that you'd like to share with the group? Yeah, I mean, the, the panelists here uh, are, you know, come from, uh, you know, some more tech backgrounds uh, than I have. So I'm working with uh, smaller organizations, um, you know, public media organizations where we might not have uh, the level of resources to, to be able to implement uh, some of these technologies. But I think coming down to basics when it comes to technology and ensuring uh, that you have consistency uh, in how you're pulling your reporting uh, and sticking with, you know, those consistent uh, measures, so you're able to measure how effective uh, your recruiting is, even when we're talking about implementing AI or other uh, new technologies into it, making sure we're measuring to see how effective those things are. Uh, and how effective even uh, your sourcing techniques are, how effective uh, DEI is on top of everybody's mind, uh, how, how effective your DEI strategies are uh, through pulling consistent reporting on your candidates um, as well, I think is, is something that's always important to, to talk about, even if it's not sort of the most uh, new thing, but I think it's something that companies don't aren't always doing. Um, and without measuring something, it's really hard to see how effective you you are being with that uh, technology or strategy. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, uh, for everyone, the panelists have really shared how important embracing technology is to go into measurements and growth and, you know, just uh, being able to recognize employees. So really great answers. You know, one of the next questions is kind of two part, you know, how is data fueling hire, hiring innovation but then what challenges are related to data-driven hiring? So Melissa, um, what do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting. I think um, the challenges uh, sometimes lie in uh, coming away from a, a human approach to recruiting. So as a recruiter, I see uh, my job as building relationships, uh, ensuring a very streamlined process, engaging candidates very effectively throughout uh, even the smallest of touch points. And I think technology is amazing uh, to measure how you're doing. Uh, and you know, as Carly was talking about, uh, measuring the potential of an employee versus uh, only seeing the, their experience. But I think it's equally as important to ensure that that human touch stays throughout the process. So using the technology in the background, but having the same like uh, lovely touch points along the way to make a candidate excited about your role um, and making sure that they know uh, that you're really interested in them versus uh, making something uh, very automated throughout the process. So I would say like those are some of the challenges uh, that sometimes come into play if a company is getting too data driven. Okay, thank you. Carly? Yeah, I think the data itself is the challenge, right? I think there's just so much of it at this point. So thinking about, you know, from the perspective of an HR leader being asked to answer questions on at the drop of the hat um, about their workforce, um, the data itself becomes incredibly unwieldy. Um, and the no matter how sophisticated the technology is that you're using, whether it's AI or some other form of, of technology that's data driven, it's only so good as the data that's that is being inputted into it. Um, so having clean, usable, and current data, and and having a lot of data is really going to be paramount. 
Um, I, I also think that connecting ROI, right? Like you're going to have to be able to defend some of the decisions that you're making, some of the investments that you're making, leveraging data. Um, so companies that are doing this really well are the ones who are tying ROI to real business outcomes, not just recruiting outcomes, not just how quickly you or how much you can reduce the time to hire, but then taking it one step further and tacking that data to real business outcomes in terms of innovation, output, productivity. Uh, those are the, the organizations who are really going to see the, the most uh, bang for their buck in terms of the data that they're leveraging. Great, thank you. Uh, Shifla. Yeah, great, great points, Melissa and Carly, actually. So quality of data is, yes, supremely, supremely important. The, the way uh, I, and, and both of you, yes, I completely agree that first of you, we shouldn't be losing the human touch. Secondly, the accuracy, the quality of data and the amount of data basically to make the decision. Uh, they both are supremely important. The, the plus side of data, uh, assuming all of these boxes are checked, is uh, a whole lot. Basically, um, you know, you can you can find out which background or uh, which certain skill sets have been, uh, you know, a good quality of hire for your company. Are there any consistent uh, reasons for offer declines? Are there any specific set of candidates who uh, who are not successful in your in your company? Is it certain team in your company? Is it certain organization is it certain you know background these people are coming from and you can build the training programs you can actually do the internal trainings based on that data uh, the other thing i always I, i'm always amused by by the set of data and how it is used is build those predictions for the next year so what happened last year is pretty much gives me the picture of what is going to happen next year. But again, you require a certain amount of data for that. So uh, plus one, uh, because data is complex to collect, uh, it's complex to analyze, but provided that if we start walking on this path, there are some really big fruits, as I said, the predictive analysis, success ratio, quality of fires, time to fail, the productivity, uh, and even the candidate experience. So uh, data, data is a base for building those metrics, which normally will fit to talent acquisition organizations. Uh, that's, that's how I feel about the uh, data fuel technology, if you want to say so. Great, thank you, thank you. Our next question is also a two part. You know, first part, what are the key challenges related to recruiting? And then what is working and where do you think companies make the biggest mistakes? Uh, Melissa, I'll go ahead and kick off with you again. Sure, happy to. Um, so challenges sometimes can be very dependent on your industry or your company. Uh, again, coming from a uh, public media organization, a lot of the time uh, the challenges are related to uh, com competition in the marketplace, right? Being competitive sometimes uh, with compensation. Uh, sometimes, and I think for, especially for a lot of tech driven industries and firms, uh, it could just be a lack of candidates in the marketplace for the skills that you uh, are needing. Um, but I think something that's really important, no matter what, is to ensure as a company, you understand really what your value proposition is. So for us, uh, sometimes that isn't compensation. Um, sometimes that could be other things. Uh, for example, you know, having a really flexible workplace, um, having a, a workplace that really values uh, genuinely, uh, not just kind of talks about it, uh, that work-life balance. And so I think what really works when you are speaking with candidates and we're, when you're bringing candidates uh, through the process is to ensure that you understand as a company what your value proposition is uh, and, and they get a glimpse of that through all of the different pieces throughout the process. I think uh, sometimes companies can make the mistake of um, not being clear on their company values um, or that value proposition and that can sometimes lead to um, down the line a fit that isn't quite mutual. Great, thank you. Uh, Carly, what are your thoughts? I want to I want to jump in on um, a comment that Melissa made around some of those um, hard to find skills in the market. I think that's where technology really stands to to shine and support recruiting efforts um, when you need a specific skill. 
uh, it's much easier to find potential candidates for that role when you broaden the scope of what you're looking for based upon skills that you know will either propel somebody into that role quickly um, or that if they have those skills that they can easily upskill into the role. Um, so kind of broadening your funnel, so to speak, using the technology available um, to, to identify a broader talent pool, I think is really critical. Um, but in terms of some of the, the key challenges, um, one that I think that will probably resonate a lot for folks, um, the world just continues to give us excuses to talk about how quickly things can change. <laughs> Um, so late 2022, early 2023, it's been no different. We've seen market disruptions that have led to reductions in force that were then followed by heavy recruiting efforts, right? Like it's this, it's more than an ebb and flow. It's kind of like a giant wave washing over us and then trying to retreat and figure out where we go from there. Um, the organizations that have um, have made more flexible, proactive workforce strategies, maybe they're tapping into contingent talent or gig workers. Uh, maybe they're really monitoring market trends to understand that ebb and flow more effectively. Those are the organizations that were able to really contract and expand more nimbly than organizations that were relying heavily on more of that traditional talent planning strategy. Um, so kind of leveraging the technology in a way that um, the market disruptions don't pose yet another challenge to recruiting, I think is is um, certainly um, something that is more available to broader uh, broader HR teams at this point. Great, thank you so much. Shipla? Um, plus one, Carly, I was literally thinking about the market tides, you know, it, it goes up, then it comes down and, and it's been challenging time, quite unpredictable. I'm just going to, you know, kind of put a basic recruiter hat at this moment and uh, lay out two or three things which constantly I have seen as a challenge, irrespective of the industry, irrespective of size of the company or the field that you are in. The first one, um, which I consistently feel and advocate for, is to have a very clear job description. Whatever it is, whichever company it is, you're, you're hiring a salesman, you're hiring a CEO of a company please state it out clearly, what you need, where you need, how you need it. Secondly, uh, one size doesn't fit all. Like even though there is one requisition, you may have someone who is really great in their job, but does not fit into your, um, uh, you know, the, the square box of screening candidates. So know what it takes to hire a good talent. Is it one consistent screening method? Is it more personal interaction? Is it more meeting for a coffee and understanding your skills? Or is it just sending some random test to those candidates and find out if they are a suitable fit? So the second thing is personalize the initial screening method to find out who your purple squirrel is versus you know uh, putting out a wide net there. And the third thing is waiting on making hiring decisions for weeks. That actually is a big no-no for me, because if you know that someone is really great at their job, then there are 10,000 recruiters out there who know that someone is great at their job. So move through the process really swiftly. And uh, these three things I consistently feel are important and are challenged. Uh, throughout the recruitment process, irrespective of the company. And uh, if we want to get better in any of the parameters of talent acquisition, be it productivity, candidate experience, the metrics, we need to get better at these three basic things. Great, thank you. So, you know, we're talking about key challenges to recruiting and a question for the audience has come up. And Carly, how can we ensure we are inclusive in hiring practices? Yeah, I think um, I, I was at a conference last week and it was really interesting to hear Keith Sonderling, um, the chairman of the EEOC, talking about technology in, in this space. Um, and what was really exciting to me was to hear somebody whose full-time job is to identify organizations who are improperly using technology and creating bias say, I want this technology to put me out of a job. Um, so he's kind of re representing both sides of the of the coin, right? We know that there are a lot of dangers when it comes to leveraging technology because of the bias it can create, but we also know the power of the technology in terms of eliminating and mitigating bias. 
Um, so where I've seen um, where I've seen technology really support um, an inclusive hiring slate um, is by removing any sort of indicator of who the person is from a from a personal perspective, right? We're masking names, we're hiding any sort of indicators of what gender or race might be. So what you're looking at is really the raw capability of the person, what they've done in the past, and more importantly, what they'd be capable of doing in the future, rather than um, introducing any sort of data that might um, trigger some sort of unconscious bias within the person who is reviewing uh, the material. Obviously, at the end of the day, a human needs to make the final decision. Um, and through the recruiting process, you'll get to know the person more effectively. But in terms of creating a, a funnel that is inclusive, um, technology is is allowing us to, to automatically and automatically remove a lot of the information that might otherwise um, stop somebody from the get-go from being included in, in the funnel. Great, thank you. Shifla, I know in, in, in your work, very technology driven, uh, <laughs> something else to add here? Um, when we build the inclusive funnel, the way Carly said, the second thing that comes in picture is having the inclusive interview panel. So it is super important that the panel has a different way of thinking or looking at the candidate or assessing the candidate. So as much as it is important to have the, uh, the inclusive slate that is coming on site, it is important that we are making decisions which are unbiased. So at scale, uh, there, are, there are these um, unbiased uh, interview trainings, which I found supremely helpful and having the all-inclusive panel. As we start building the slate, it is even important that the job descriptions company-wide that we built internally or externally should be free of any um, words that explain the gender, the race. So building inclusive job description is important. Building very cautious scale or uh, the onset slate for all candidates, diverse candidate is important. And even more important that the company and the company executives are being trained on making those inclusive hiring decisions. Um, so I think these two, three things, four things, they will help us at least get started on the way there is a long path that we need to build still to bring all this include inclusive talent on board. Thank you. You know, Melissa, how about your thoughts on this important question? Yeah. Um you know, as, as Shilba said in, in, in one of the last questions, you know, coming back down to basics, I think is important here. Um, when we're talking about an entire hiring process, for me, uh, of course, Shilba, it starts with the, the job description, but then after that, um, having an intake meeting with your hiring manager or the hiring team, where you're discussing the process, where you are um, discussing the goals of your company, um, you are ensuring that you are setting a hiring process up front with your hiring manager so you know exactly what the process will be, who will be involved, what stages of the interview will they be examining uh, what, um, and ensuring that you are on the same page with the hiring manager so then when you're having initial conversations with the candidate, they understand what the process is and you are holding uh, both yourself your company accountable for what you set out at the outset of the process as far as um, the steps. Uh, because sometimes what, what can happen is uh, a hiring manager or a hiring team can get excited about, about a particular candidate and everything gets thrown out the window. Uh, and then you're not, you're not then offering an inclusive and equitable process for other candidates. So uh, it really does start at the very beginning um, at, at before you even launch a role sometimes uh, in having these conversations. And as Shilpa mentioned, um, training for, for managers and for interviewers is so important. Um, so they have the skills to be able to assess candidates in all facets, um, including anti-bias training uh, that has to come in uh, to be effective uh, in this work. Great, thank you. And you know, while I've got you on the stage here, what do you think are the most important interview tips or techniques that you've seen work to assure a candidate is a good fit? Yeah, I mean, it really does kind of go hand in hand with that, that last question. So 
Uh, again, like training, uh, there, there, I don't think is anything more important uh, than having training around proper interviewing techniques. Uh, and even ensuring, uh, and, and I've heard this before when people kind of come into some uh, some of the panel interviews, which I think is definitely an important part of the process, they feel like they're coming up against a firing squad. So ensuring you're even training your managers and your panelists uh, to be friendly, uh, to make it a, a space where people feel comfortable, because if people aren't feeling comfortable, uh, your candidates aren't feeling comfortable, they're surely not going to be able to put their best foot forward, and you're not going to be able to get uh, a really true view of that candidate in that interview process. So I think that's important, is setting the stage uh, to make it comfortable for candidates. Um, but again, coming back to the basics, behavioral interview questions, um, and ensuring that you have examples of things that the candidate ha has done that aligns to your job or your values or your industry or whatever you're looking for is so important. Um, and you know, as a recruiter, uh, I am fairly involved in the panel interview process, uh, so much so that, that I'm even coaching on the questions that they're asking. Um, so if you don't have a lens as a recruiter into the interview, it's very hard uh, to help, uh, you know, add knowledge uh, and skill into that interview process. Great, thank you. Uh, Shipla, what are your thoughts? So really what I feel is when you are interviewing a candidate, the candidate is interviewing you as well. It is not one way process and you are a representative of the company. So very basics that you come prepared for the interview when, when you are interviewing someone, know what role, what questions, and what are you really assessing the candidate for? Be prepared to share your story, be prepared to share your experiences and why you are still working with the company because you are a face of that company to a candidate who is going to go out and either say good things about the company or bad things about the company. So you have more at stake than the candidate. I always feel that way. Uh, secondly, it is important that uh, personalize the interview, be professional, be positive. It is, it is very, very possible that as like a new grad, if you are a professional who did not interview from last 10, 15 years, and even nowadays you see that kind of uh, candidates a lot who have been you know working with one company 10, 15 years in, in tech field, currently there have been a uh, layoff waves going on. So we have been talking to candidates who didn't even interview for 15, 18 years. It is, important that you are making them comfortable, making them feel positive, and you are you are putting your best foot forward. You are a good listener. Uh, you are more organized and you are prepared for the interview, and you are ready to provide specific examples, asking right questions, and even sharing your stories. So again, going back to the best ex candidate experience that you can provide is something you should absolutely be doing as an interviewer and explaining the next steps too. So I feel these couple of basic things in addition to your interview questions will lead into get great candidate experience and the hiring process. Great, thank you. Curly, what about your thoughts? Yeah, so um, I obviously have been kind of working in and around the recruiting space um, at Eightfold, but my, my history and background is in broader talent strategy. So uh, my, my prior life before joining Eightfold, um, I was focusing on creating a perspective on what is a skills-based organization. Um, I'm sure that a lot of folks on the call right now are probably um, either uh, excited to hear that or rolling their eyes because it's been around for a while and I'm not sure that we've been able to like really put our finger on what that means. But um, you know, I'm still really passionate about the idea of organizations kind of shifting their talent practices to becoming more skills-based. Um, so I say all of that because I think one really critical component of the hiring process that is very difficult to nail, and I would love for Shelpa or Melissa to call me out if I'm wrong about this, uh, but trying to assess for what I think we all commonly refer to as soft skills, I don't love that name for them, but um, you know, power skills, pivot skills, the skills that allow people to um, apply their hard skills in different contexts and really flex as a person. Um, those are just notoriously difficult to, to figure out if the person has it just in, over the course of a few um, interviews. So I did a little bit of, of homework because I've, I've always just felt, you know, this is really important, but I'm not really sure how to, how to, um, how to nail it 
um, in the interview process. And um, interestingly enough, if anybody out there is an Economist subscriber, there was a recent article um, that talked about this. So I'll share a little bit of that. Um, there's some research coming out of Rice University that found that people who can accurately gauge which members of a team wield influence have the power skill, so to speak, of status acuity. Um, and there have been some additional research done where status ability to, to identify somebody's status um, actually has a lot of associations and adjacencies to other power skills. So being able to accurately read a room um, is a really great sign that somebody has those, um, those other power skills like influence, communication. Um, so, so it's something to consider. Um, and then some other, you know, you can, you can just uh, do the, the simple things of asking how the candidate interacted during the recruitment process with other members of the team. How did they treat the sourcer? How did they treat the scheduler? If it was an in-person meeting, how did they treat the, the person who brought them into the room, right? Um, I think it's it's just really important um, to, to make sure that not only is this person going to be a cultural fit for you, but that they'll be able to last a long time knowing that in the world that we live in, the job that they're hired for is probably not the job that they're going to be in one to two years down the line. Great. Thank you. You know, it, it's funny, Carly, because I wanted to move away from soft skills myself. And so now I'm using agilities, you know, like critical thinking, you know, you think of like being agile and being able to do it. So I'm, you know, uh, using agilities. But, you know, while, while I have you on, we have a really interesting question from the audience, and it's a, really a technical one. My team has been utilizing AI in coordination with their ATS, but we are still looking at ways to integrate new AI capabilities such as chat GPT. What do you see in regards to chat GPT and new AI capil capabilities for recruiting and hiring moving forward and how how will it alter hiring strategies in the near future? I man, I wish I could get ChatGPT to do my job for me. I still haven't <laughs> figured it out. Um, but that said, uh, definitely a lot of applications. Before I say anything about that, though, my my first caveat is be careful, right? ChatGPT is not yet regulated, um, and if you've been following what's been going on in Congress for the past couple of days. Um, even the founder of ChatGPT is saying, we need to regulate this stuff because it's dangerous. Um, so within the recruiting space, especially if you're in a highly regulated industry, um, just be careful and, and make sure, as with any sort of tech adoption, that you're uh, making sure from a compliance and regulatory perspective that you're comfortable with it and it's explainable not only to your to the people using it, uh, but to the um, end user, the folks who are impacted by it, the candidates, the recruiters. Um, so that's my first caveat. Uh, but in terms of what we're seeing out there in the market, a lot of um, AI platforms are introducing something similar to the co-pilot that uh, Microsoft introduced for a recruiter. So um, think about your job description. Um, if you if you need to create a job description, you can do it in seconds instead of hours or, or weeks requiring back and forth uh, communication and alignment internally. Um, so so job descriptions are definitely going to be sped up with chat GPT, um, as well as just kind of navigating the recruiting process if all of the data is in one place. Um, having conversational AI kind of help guide the um, the identification of candidates, the process of doing that. Um, we're seeing more and more of that come online. Um, but again, with the caveat that a lot of the, the vendors who are introducing chat GPT powered functionality are giving their uh, clients the opportunity to opt out because it still is not regulated. One, one thing to add in there, um is ChatGPT, what, where I use ChatGPT uh, is getting the data uh, of the location. So say, for example, if you are hiring um, someone who is working in marketing or someone like data scientists, ChatGPT told me that there are the highest number of data scientists in Austin. So uh, if, and, and that data was pretty accurate because we at Expedia, we do pull data from various resources to build our own talent acquisition strategy as to which locations we want to build for certain skill sets where we, we want to grow the team. And ChatGPT and BART, both AI tools, they actually gave me pretty accurate data, even though when I compared them 
with each other and with the manual data that my data analytics team provided. So for that, yes, um, I would say 60% accuracy in the job description because they did not show the inclusivity, by the way. They just built the, the job description. So uh, for, for the vanilla skills, like building job description, building the search strings, uh, giving you the data per location, um, that, that do uh, provide a help, but it, it, it would not replace the human accuracy. I should, I should put it out there and it's not regulated. Great, thank you. Um, you know, taking another audience question, uh, Melissa, it can be challenging to have a high volume of candidates per requisition. What are your thoughts on assessment screenings? Are these effective in hiring the best candidate fits? Yeah, I mean, it's it's a, that's a difficult question. Um, it sort of depends on how high your volume is uh, and how quickly you wanna whittle down uh, that candidate pool. Um, for me, I uh, typically steer clear on an initial assessment as sort of a first interaction, because I think you can uh, very easily knock people out of your candidate pool that would be a great fit. Um, so I hate to say it, and I've, I've worked in some pretty high volume places. Um, it really comes down to uh, getting through those applications. Uh, you know, there are definitely ways you can whittle them down quickly depending on uh, your requirements. So, you know, for example, if you're uh, requiring certain bits of information and they don't have it, you can knock them out very quickly within seconds of screening. Um, but if you're using like basic assessment questions uh, that are not uh, super skilled based, maybe it's an experience, number of years of experience, things like that, that might be okay to knock people out. Um, but having an assessment go out as a first interaction, um, I, that's not something that uh, I prefer as a, a recruiter personally. I, I think you could lose out on a lot of great candidates that way. Great, thank you. Um, so we've got another question here, Carly, really for you and I, that we mentioned not a fan of the term of soft skills and to ensure that I'm aware of potential concerns with certain terminology, what are we hearing about this long use term that may warrant assigning it to a new name. So I'll kind of go first. So, you know, for me, soft skills are the hard stuff. So it's funny that they call them soft skills because it is literally the hardest competency for any inspire, you know, aspiring leader or leader to have. And so I do use soft skills, but the reason I'm sort of rebranding under agilities is there are a lot more assessment capabilities where I can have people take even self-assessments of sort of how they show up in critical thinking or communication and so forth, where I just felt soft skills were uh, too broad. Carly, what was your thoughts on soft skills? It's very similar. Uh, I, I find that soft skills not only are the, the hard thing to get right, I also find that they're incredibly important to be successful long term. Um, so the word soft uh, just kind of co connotes that the, that they're not as important as hard skills. Um, so trying to use a different terminology to help really elevate the fact that these are the most important skills, not to mention I'm a, a subscriber to uh, to Josh Burson <laughs> um, yes. and, and he definitely <laughs> has pushed us away from uh, from soft skills. Uh, I think power skills is his terminology for it. Yeah. Thank you. Shipley, you talked a lot about training. And so one of the participants was asking, do you have any suggestions for virtual interview training for managers? Yes, yes, yes. Too many. Um, so first thing I would I would really ask is when you are in person, I would say you have kind of that uh, upper hand because you are meeting with the candidate in person, you are able to figure out from uh, the interaction, how, where the candidate is, like in terms of, are they feeling comfortable? They are completely in the interview process. They are not. When you are virtually interviewing someone, A, you are bound by the time. Secondly, you are there just to finish, uh, uh, you know, certain assessments in the certain given, uh, certain time period. What I would say is for any virtual interview, it is super important that uh, you get trained on uh, first off, 
the candidate getting into the process first of getting candidate into into onto the same page that you are in and secondly as i said the all inclusive process so there are two trainings that i would highly highly recommend first is unbiased interview training the second one is how to be an interviewer so this both trainings are, I mean, there are multiple learning platforms which provide these trainings and they will help you get more um, influential interactive, uh, interactive interviewer. So what that means is uh, basically you are explaining the role, you are explaining the company, you are explaining and asking very clear questions. You are prepared with the follow-up questions and or explanation, and you are providing candidate an inclusive experience throughout the interview. Um, and it is as simple as, uh, you know, you're providing the example and you are calling out the gender. For example, he said this, she said this versus saying they said it. Or you are giving a very specific example of your company, which may or may not be related to the candidate or the background that they are coming from and to which they do not feel that they are connected or benefiting from it or asking very vague questions. So these two, yes, for the virtual interview are must-haves. And what I would suggest is you have some good interviewers and you have some training interviewers. So never ever have any interviewer just go online and start interviewing before shadowing and reverse shadowing and training the interviewer on your companies. So normally I go with 555. What that means is you prepare five times, you get shadowed by a seasoned interviewer five times, and someone reverse shadows you and provide you the experience five times before you go on doing your interview independently. And that has been helped so far. Great, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Melissa, this is a really interesting question. We're really struggling to find ways to differentiate our organization to improve candidate attraction. Please share, please share some ways you have seen companies assure that they stand out. Yeah, I mean, I think it comes back to something that we talked about a little bit earlier. Um, you have to know what your company's value proposition is, and you should be highlighting that uh, in every place that you are uh, front-facing candidates, whether that's job descriptions, whether that's your website, whether that's initial conversations, you have to know what, you have to start off by knowing what exactly your company is offering um, in terms of, you know, uh, the life that it will bring them, uh, the values that your company holds, and making sure you're highlighting that. Um, I think that is, then again, you are ensuring a mutual match uh, from candidates that are being uh, attracted to your company and, and candidates that are a good fit for you. So I would say making sure you are uh, stringing that value proposition along in all of your interactions is certainly a best practice. I'd like to jump in on this one as yeah. well. I think we also mentioned personalization earlier, personalization of the process. And that starts from the first time they visit your career site. Um, if they have to jump through a million hoops to apply, the likelihood of them getting to the end of that application is slim to none. Um, so trying to streamline the application process as much as possible um, and, and making it simple enough that, you know, we, we talk about... Um, we often talk about uh, visit ratios, right? Folks who visit the site, how many times they're visiting the site. Let's talk about how many times they visit the site in relation to how quickly they apply. Ideally, you only want them to visit once. They shouldn't have to come back. Um, so creating that kind of personalized and very easy experience from the get-go, I think is really critical. Thank you. So we have come to the end of our time and really we wanna thank the audience, such great participation. Our panelists are amazing. So much insight, so much learning today. And now I'd like to hand it back to Vicki Lynn to um, close us out. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Carly, Melissa, Shilpa, and Rose for a fabulous panel discussion. We've already gotten good feedback on it. So it's nice to hear that everyone's really loving all of your experience. Thank you for sharing it today. I also want to thank everyone for joining us today and let you know that this session, along with all of today's content, will be available on demand following the event. Thank you again to a fabulous panel.